These are the stories of the ER doctors never talk about. How am I gonna get this guy up to the intensive care unit? He's just too big. You sure it was a rattlesnake? Ralph was under the impression that because he would drink the venom that he was immune to snake venom. Blood shoots eight feet across the room. I just found out that... Why was this guy not telling me the story? Why wasn't he being straight with me from the beginning? These are the ones I'll never forget. It's only a matter of seconds. And then you realize this person lives or dies because of me. These are real stories told by the real doctors who lived them. Snake bites, time is uh, of the essence. Two minutes, Ralph. You stay with me for two minutes. All right, let's go. Come okay. on with me. Here, are in the hospital, going to the ER, Ralph. Stay with me. Stay with the more time that Venom is on board, the more destruction is done. Hey, got the snake bites in shock. What room? Ralph Prado has a very unusual profession. He is a snake charmer in the circus. Right. Bring him this way, bring him this way. Snakes didn't cause him a lot of alarm because he worked with him on a routine basis in a circus act. Pulse 35, respiration. Dr. Sean Bush knows how lethal snake venom can be. He acquired his first snake from his grandfather at age five and now keeps two dozen as pets and research subjects. Let's get him on a trip, please. I think snakes are one of the most amazing creatures on the planet. They exhibit very unusual, very poorly understood behavior. There's all kinds of amazement about snakes, and I share that to almost abnormal proportions. It was while working with poisonous snakes that Ralph began keeping them at home as pets. The snake had gotten loose behind the sofa, and he reached back and was trying to pull it out. Normally, snakes strike and release, and this snake hung on for 15 seconds, pumping venom in the whole time. Ralph's throat is so swollen by his body's reaction to the venom that paramedics had difficulty inserting a breathing tube. OK, they got in his esophagus. He's not getting any air. We're going to have to re-innovate. By the time he gets to the emergency department, the tube's in the wrong place. Thank you. It's in the esophagus. We have to take the tube out, uh, put it in the trachea where it belongs. Let me take it down that way. OK, I got the cords. Yep, there we go. Now, the priority is to find out what kind of snake bit him. Ralph? Ralph, was this a local snake? You sure? You sure it was a rattlesnake? Calm down, Ralph. We're trying to help you, OK? His body is having a reaction to the venom, an allergic reaction, because he's been bitten on a previous occasion. All right, Ralph, it's going to be OK. So. Take it easy, Ralph. All right. Okay, Two for us. He's around here. Just hold that thing. He's going to strap over here, Mike. Really, fight it. Take it easy, Ralph. Okay, it's OK. Ralph. We're where he has the snake fangs, puncture wound, he's bleeding from there, bleeding from his nose, from his GI tract, he's bleeding out of everywhere. Yeah, this guy's really sick. This is, okay. yeah, yeah, this is bad. Right. Okay. Okay. You okay, Ralph? I've dealt with hundreds of snake bites, and I've never seen someone as sick as Ralph. Rescue three. As a licensed pilot, Dr. Rob Steele knows that disregard for safety and overconfidence can lead to disaster. I am not getting any love today. It's a lesson that also applies to the ER. This is a day that I have never forgotten, and this is a day that changed me. Rob Brenham, a 30-year-old paralegal, is the victim of an assault he just moved to the city a year ago from a small rural town. So what's up with this guy? Did he get in a fight or what? Guess so. He can't be here too bad. He walked from his apartment down to the ambulance. When we saw this guy, he had a couple of hits to his face, a little bit of a black eye. This guy is not badly injured. 
Hi, Rob. Um, Dr. Steele. Actually, my name's Rob as well. Same name. Looks like you got the worst of it here. I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I've been on the receiving end of a few punches in my day as well. All right, let's take a look. He tells me that he was hit with some fists and kicked and um, beat up uh, by uh, somebody who he knew. This guy is wasting our resources. But you never know until you get into it. As a doctor, sometimes you can't trust your first gut instinct or your first impression because sometimes these people are here for a very valid reason and sometimes it saved their lives. For circus performer Ralph Prado, who was bitten by one of his poisonous pet snakes, time is his greatest enemy. You're a new one in the left, this is 2.36. Calm down, Ralph, we're trying to help you, okay? We gave you much of that, morphine. Venom destroys tissue, and it does that by digesting it. The sooner you can get anti-venom on board, the sooner you can stop that irreversible injury from occurring. But while it's on, it's just tearing up your tissue. Type across for three units of blood. All right. Stat lab. Ralph Prado thought he was immune because he had been milking his snakes and drinking the venom. He had been bitten several times before and always recovered. But in fact, each bite was making him more allergic to the venom. Now the poison is spreading through his helpless body and he can't even tell the doctors what kind of snake bit him. Hey, Ralph, was this a local snake? Until Dr. Bush can find out for sure, he's made an educated guess that it's a local Western rattlesnake. OK, let's start the antivenom, Mike. Let's get the crow fat. Crow fat. Relax, don't fight it, Ralph. Look at that. It's like worms moving underneath the skin. If he's wrong, Ralph will die. Meanwhile, Dr. Rob Steele has a feeling in his gut that something isn't on the up and up with his 30-year-old paralegal patient. So I'm as nice and polite as I can be with this guy. And I start hearing his story. It doesn't really seem to be anything uh, too serious here. So you want to tell me what happened? Just some guy I know. We got in the fight. Yeah, I'm not very impressed. And to be honest, I'm not that sympathetic with this guy. I'm, I'm thinking, this guy, you just got in a fight, you lost your fight, quit whining, go home. I'm having a lot of trouble breathing. I feel, I feel dizzy. But then he tells me that he's really short of breath, which kind of sets up a little red flag for me. Huh, any idea what might have precipitated this? Um, as... So I start trying to ask him, well, why are you so short of breath? And he doesn't really want to come forth with the information. He's not real talkative. Look, Rob, I'm trying to help you out here, okay? But you gotta get Part of being an ER doctor is that you have to develop a partnership with the patient. You have to develop a bond very quickly, and you have to trust what they're telling you. But this patient just isn't telling me what's going on. I know that there's something else going on. Okay, why don't you just lay back? <laughs> Go ahead and lay back. When I look up at the heart monitor that we have that's right there, He's tacking away. This guy's going at 140 beats a minute. The normal rate in a healthy man Rob's age is half that. Rob? He's getting tacked. OK, uh, I need some help in here, please. OK, Rob, Rob, stay with me here, buddy. OK, we got a code here. All right, help me get his wheels up. I look up at the monitor, and I see that his heartbeat is 160. I look back at the patient, and he's unconscious. I know something very serious is going wrong here. Dr. Steele can't believe he was moments away from sending his patient home, and now the man is near death. Ralph Prado is quite a character a circus performer who is a favorite of kids and adults alike. But now he's dying of a snake bite, and Dr. Sean Bush is doing all he can to keep him alive. OK, let's start the antivenom, Mike. Let's get the crow fab. Crow fab. Hopefully, he won't suffer any permanent 
Neurological damage. Rub these between your hands. With no time to identify whether the snake was an exotic breed or a more common domestic species, Dr. Bush begins to administer antivenom. But the hospital only has antivenom that will treat the most common North American snake bites. Wait, don't we just keep pumping this stuff in here? Yeah, until all six are gone, yeah. Going in with number four. We give him his first dose of antivenom, but he doesn't respond at all. It's as if nothing had been given. Okay, this is number six going in. Yeah, um, that's not going to be enough. Let's get him six more. Still twitching a bit, huh? Thank you. Here, you take that. Tie this off. All right, you guys got this. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. The domestic antivenom is not working. It's now more critical than ever that Dr. Bush identify this snake. Uh, we could really use some help here. I sent the sheriff out to retrieve that snake and bring it back to me so that I could identify the snake and know if we were using the right antivenom. Has he gotten FFP? Uh, yeah, he got some, and we have two more units to go. And we repeat these parameters, and we look, and he's still doing worse. So I say, let's double it again, give him some more. And before you know it, we've given him almost 60 vials of antivenom, which is a record dose at the time. Dr. Bush marks Ralph's arm to monitor the advancement of the poison now threatening his patient's vital systems. While we're waiting for the snake to come in, we're continuing to treat him like a rattlesnake bite from one of our typical rattlesnakes. But if it was an exotic, then the antivenom wouldn't work, and so it would be futile. So we're just wondering if we're even doing the right thing. Dr. Michael Wolf is known around the ER as a jokester, but today he's going to wonder if the joke isn't on him. Don't work too hard. I was a resident. We were sitting around with the other residents, the nurses, the techs. We were all just, you know, doing crossword puzzle type things, reading various books. Hassan Kumar drives a cab 12 hours a day. She's having a baby. Hey, get no B, kid, OK? He came to the US from Pakistan two years ago. Where is she? She's having a baby. And this is his first child. She's having a baby where? Down there, the silver card. That card? Yes, down there. I stare in disbelief as if your wife is there. Uh, yes. Why don't you drive right here? I didn't sit down so loud, One time, someone obeys a sign around here. Part of me wanted to insult him. Like, what, are you, what were you thinking? And then part of me is thinking, all right, you know, you're an emergency physician. You're in a situation. You have to figure out the best way to deal with it. Uh, all right, I'm going to go. You guys stay. Come on. Yes. Go. Let's go. The patient is about to give birth in her car. Dr. Wolf now has to get her into the hospital as quickly as possible. Next time your wife delivers, you drive right up to the front, OK? You tell him I told you. OK, I will. Thank you. You got any little help in here? Can you please drop it? All right. Heart rate 180 and climb. Well, let's get off. In just a few seconds, Dr. Robert Steele's secretive patient has slid from stable to barely alive. Now it's a race to figure out why. I take a shirt off. The front is fine. There's nothing wrong there. But you can just see, just on where his lats are, just kind of on the side, What's you can this? see a bandage. What the hell is that? I strip the bandage off, and you can see this guy has a stab wound right there. Why wouldn't he tell me about that? Um, I can't really understand why his story isn't jiving with, with the injuries that I'm seeing. But I have to do something right now. There's not, there's not getting any air into this lung. I think we're looking at a tension pneumothorax. I suspect what's going on is that he has so much air in his chest that it's actually shifting his heart and all of the structures, the aorta and everything else, over to the other side and kinking it like a hose so that his heart is trying to pump against a kinked hose. And it doesn't work. Can we call radiology? I don't think he's going to last that long. Um... I have to act, and I have to act now. Because if I don't, he's going to be dead in the next several seconds. Um, some betadine. 
The young doctor has a few seconds to perform a procedure he's only read about in medical books. Here we go, Rob. Rob, your gloves. That's fine. Dr. Steele pierces his patient's chest to release the pressure that's building up inside. I grab a scalpel and I make an incision. And as soon as I make that incision, I go through the chest wall and it's like a balloon popped and it explodes right onto me. Dr. Rob Steele has to relieve a tension pneumothorax in a young paralegal named Rob Brenham. I am covered from head to toe in blood. And what I hear is as the air decompresses out of his chest. Blood shoots eight feet across the room and I can feel the stickiness of the blood and I smell the sick coppery metal smell of the blood. Pulse is dropped. 160, 145. But the patient is doing better. His heart rate is coming down, his blood pressure is coming up, and he regains consciousness. I was right. He had a tension pneumothorax, and we corrected it. Rob, relax. I tell him, you almost died. You know that? Because you didn't tell me that you were stabbed in, in your side here. And he doesn't say anything to me. All right, let's, uh, let's get a tube in and get him upstairs to admitting as soon as we can. Dr. Steele inserts a tube through the incision and starts suctioning the air from the chest cavity. This allows the left lung to reinflate. Okay. Got that? You all right? With all signs now reading normal, the patient is wheeled to another floor to recover. This is one of the highest moments of my life. I have just saved this guy's life. This guy was on the brink of death and I have brought him back. Saving a life is what we as doctors want to do. That's what we train for. That's what all the sleepless nights are for. At that moment while I'm getting myself all cleaned up, I am floating on cloud nine. Dr. Michael Wolf has seen nervous dads to be before, but he has never seen one as confused as this immigrant taxi driver who can't even find a parking space in a totally empty parking lot. How long has she been having contractions? Uh, I don't know, two hours. Okay. Do you have any medical problems? No, I don't think so. Okay. You could see through the windshield from dozens of yards away that she had that expression that women tend to get later on in, in labor. Hello, what's your name? Uh, Jaya. Hi, Jaya, I'm Dr. Wolf. Uh, uh, Please, uh, listen, I need to just check your cervix for a second, OK? Uh, She's fully dilated. We don't have much time. You could tell that the baby was about to be born. So I decided we can make it to labor and delivery. Listen, you get in the front and drive to the entrance. Okay, listen, I got to get in there. I initially looked in the back seat thinking I would get in there, and it was just filled with various stuff and boxes. I can't get in that back. I'm sorry. Excuse me. All right. I had nowhere else to go, so I climbed in the car on top of his wife. She's sitting there huffing and puffing. Kumar, fire it up. Let's go. Kumar, what's going on? Kumar. Kumar, you need the keys. You idiot. Kumar, you stupid idiot. He couldn't find the keys. Kumar, you need the keys. You idiot. Kumar. Jaya is in the final stages of labor, and Dr. Wolf is having difficulty getting her into the hospital. Kumar, you need the keys. 
Dr. Paul Castillo has a passion for venturing to the remote corners of the world with no set plans. These adventures test his abilities for self-reliance and improvisation, traits that come in handy in the ER. I think I've seen everything imaginable come through the ER doors. Until I see the fire department and paramedics dragging somebody's king-sized mattress with an enormous person on it. This is a 600-pound man. He's so big that he can't bear weight on his own legs. The paramedics found 28-year-old Luis Arroyo bedridden and barely able to move. It took a team of eight firefighters and a special double-wide ambulance to get him this far with no help from his mother. It turns out he lives with his mother. She's the one that has continued to feed him while he's been in this condition. Once he started breathing badly, his mother finally called the paramedics. He's going into cardiac arrest. They're running out of time. They must get him to the ICU now. The first question you ask is, how does somebody get this big? And it's a heartbreaking thought that he was allowed to get to this stage. His daily life must be miserable. Come on, guys. The thing that's going to save this guy's life is to get some oxygen in his lungs and get it there fast. That means I need to intubate him and put a tube down into his lungs uh, and introduce the oxygen. A little, little more, right, right there. All right. This is no normal intubation. It's a bunch of wrestling around that takes finding the right position, and you don't have that time. It's got to happen now. Okay, we're in. That part moved out of the way. He is so big that his heart can't possibly pump all that blood through all that body. This guy goes into heart failure and is at risk of dying right now. All right, we've got no pulse, guys. Start CPR, please. Oh, One, two, three. three. Let's on the head. Oh. You're out of rushing. Okay. All right, okay, guys. All right, we have to clear I all this out of here. Backed up right now. All right. Go, guys, now, go. Damn it, I said move that! Right now! How many pile x rays? To get through the treatment room doors, we had to tip the mattress up a little bit and not have the fellow fall out. That's how big he was. All right, continue CPR. All right. Okay, we need to have I didn't have the answer as to how we were going to get this gentleman up to the intensive care unit. That's where we could say, we're going to save his life. But we couldn't get there. Take, take over. Somebody. Somebody take over. Dr. Sean Bush's snakebite patient is in critical condition and may not survive. Yesterday, Ralph Prada was wearing a turban and serenading his snakes, and today he has been bitten by one of his own pets. Now the sheriff is on his way to Ralph's house, hoping to find out exactly what kind of snake bit him. Police get there in time to interrupt a neighbor of Ralph's who is destroying the snake. And so the sheriff shot the snake in the head. 
and put the snake out of its misery. 6 0 advised, hospital, we've got the snake. I'll be en route, 10 minutes ETA. 5 9 Put the snake in the box. All right, go on, get him, Steve. It's a good thing he's going to burn it all the way. Just now we can identify it. Snake yet? No, not yet. Yeah. He brings a snake in, and immediately I know it's a Southern Pacific rattlesnake. But I'm not sure that. Although a Southern Pacific rattler is a domestic snake, the only anti venom Dr. Bush has on hand may not work but he has no choice but to administer the antivenom and hope for the best. We went ahead and switched into full gear. I mean, we started really mixing the antivenom. Pharmacy wasn't mixing it fast enough, so I started grabbing a half a dozen vials and mixing myself. The way you mix it is you take the antivenom, they come in vials, it's dried, and you have to reconstitute it. Rub these between your hands. You just got to make sure you don't do it too fast so you don't get any bubbles, because we won't be able to inject it. And we needed to get this stuff in fast so we can save this man's life. Now, his vitals are all over the place. I can't even get a pulse. Every system is affected. His kidneys are affected, his GI tract. We're, we're worried that he could have injury to his brain, even. With Ralph's system not responding to the antivenom, he continues to deteriorate. I can't believe he's not responding. He is given little chance for survival. Dr. Rob Steele is feeling great about saving Rob Brenham's life, but his feelings of joy are about to end. Why, why was this guy not telling me the story? Why wasn't he being straight with me from the beginning? Rob, how are you? How are you feeling? I gotta ask you, why didn't you, uh... Why didn't you tell me you'd been stabbed? I mean, I, just, I don't get it. My boyfriend. He beat me up. I just found out that I'm HIV positive. And HIV positive? When I told him, he just went crazy. That's when he stabbed me. At that moment, my heart sunk. Could you excuse me for a moment? Dr. Steele could become infected himself by having had HIV tainted blood in his eyes. Snake bite victim Ralph Prado shows no signs of responding to the massive amounts of antivenom he's already received. Dr. Bush is now concerned that the poison may be causing hemorrhaging in his brain. Yeah, all of it, yeah. The amount of antivenom Ralph receives reaches record doses. I want to see how he reacts. Let me get a BP for you. You ready? Bleeding in the brain can cause irreversible damage, including brain death. Let's get him on a drip, then get him upstairs for a CAT scan. Okay. Luis Arroyo has three factors threatening his life. He weighs 600 pounds, he's in cardiac arrest, and Dr. Paul Castillo can't find a way to get him to the ICU. This poor guy doesn't fit on a gurney. He doesn't fit on a bed. We had to resuscitate him right on the floor on the king-size mattress. I'm sitting here thinking, how am I going to get this guy up to the intensive care unit? He's just too big. All right. Let me get me the yellow pages. Okay. Ah! 
Expectant mother Jaya is in labor, but she's not in the hospital. She's in a car, and her husband can't find the keys. I cannot no. find the keys. Are they in the ignition? No. At some point during training in emergency medicine, you always learn to kind of laugh at the ridiculousness of whatever situation you're in. Stupid idiot! You idiot! Oh, you idiot! That is a very real possibility. Plan B. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Bring a gurney! Bring a gurney! Bring a gurney! It was hard for them to hear me. I was screaming, get a gurney, and then they were all just standing there. Bring a gurney! Just bring it! Bring a gurney! Bring a gurney now! Then I started to think, you know, between this guy and all of them, maybe the whole world has, has lost their mind. If help doesn't arrive soon, Jaya may be giving birth in a parking lot. The rattlesnake venom coursing through Ralph Prado's body may now be causing bleeding in his brain. To find out, Dr. Bush orders a CAT scan. What do you think? I don't see any evidence of uh, extra-axial or intraparenchymal hemorrhage, but he's so coagulopathic, if he clinically deteriorates, you're going to have to order another head CT. OK. Thanks. You're welcome. All Dr. Bush can do is wait and see if Ralph has the will to survive. A grossly obese patient needs immediate care to save his life. All right, let me get me the yellow pages. But the ER staff has no idea how to move him to the ICU. So I remembered, I saw a show in which a veterinarian used a large animal transport backboard to move large animals onto the operating room table. Continue CPR. All right, guys. Uh, right there, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, uh, somebody bring me a roll sheet, please. That I be scared. Okay, on three, one, two, three. three. All right. Watch his head. Good. All right, guys. We still needed about eight guys to get around the edge of this backboard. Okay, hey guys, let's make this safe. We're going to go up on lift, okay? One, two, three, lift, and then we're going to lift on lift, okay? One, two, three, lift. Ah! Ah! Jaya Kumar is now just moments away from giving birth. Dr. Wolf still doesn't know how he's going to get her to the ER in time. Okay, just relax and take deep breath. Bring a gurney! When you work in the emergency department, you get to know each other well. Just bring it! When you know when someone says things Hurry a certain up. way, all right, we better just do it. We'll find out the details later. So it was one of those situations where I said, just bring it, and they knew, all right, I, for whatever reason, we have to just bring it. All right. Let's get her out. Ah. All right. All right. I found the keys. Umar, I think we all collectively just said, all right, forget it. Let's go. All right, go. I think we were all so pumped with adrenaline that we were going too fast at first. You know, she was rattling. Oh, I was trying to 
trying to calculate in my head, well, how long is it going to take to get up to labor and delivery? It's just on the fourth floor. I mean, it must be 30 seconds. Oh, you're fine. Slow deep breaths. That's it. Come on, get number four. What? Number four. Oh, number four. Oh, number four. Number four. Number four. Number four. Number four. It's at that point that I look down and see uh, the baby crowning, see the back of the baby's head. Okay. Stop the elevator, Kumar. Stop the elevator. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. Take a deep breath and push. Okay, we're gonna do this here. Is, is this proper? Okay, I don't think it's proper. The baby's coming, it's fine. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Good, good, good. That's it. I delivered the head and, and suctioned the baby and then uh, delivered the shoulders. All right, it's a baby girl. It was a pretty unremarkable delivery as they go, except for the fact that we were there in an elevator with 15 people. Okay. Okay. Why isn't she crying? Don't worry, it's okay. Give me I wasn't breathing and looked a little bluish. Give me a towel. Give me a towel. What's wrong? Why, why, why isn't she crying? It's okay. It's okay. Why, Just give it a minute. Why isn't she crying? Daddy, that's a baby girl. All right, clamp in the cord, clamp in the cord. Daddy, want to do the honors? Soon, preferably. We handed him the scissors, and I think he gave us a look of, really, you know, you trust me to do this after what I've done so far. Kumar, quickly. Hey. Dr. Robert Steele just discovered that the patient whose blood he was splattered with has tested positive for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And at that moment, I was sick because I had just been covered in this guy's blood from head to toe. And so as high as I was, I am that low now. It takes an average of 25 days for signs of HIV exposure to show up in a blood test. And at that moment, I wasn't sure if it was all worth it. Did I make the right decision? Do I really want to be an ER doc? Do I really want to put myself at risk for this type of trauma? Do I, do I really want to put my family at risk, my wife at risk? Is this, is this what I want to do? Dr. Paul Castillo's 600-pound patient, Luis Arroyo, is so large he is literally suffocating under his own weight. Moving him requires a backboard used for transporting large zoo animals. It takes the efforts of eight men, but he is finally transported to the ICU. Once we were able to transport a 600-pound man, it was an enormous sigh of relief. Over the next 24 hours, the fluid in his patient's chest is reduced so his heart can beat normally. How are you feeling? All right. Good. Breathing all right? You have any more chest pain? He is stabilized now, but it's going to take an extreme change of lifestyle to put him on the road to full recovery. I haven't seen a case that was more preventable than this one. I get used to thinking sometimes that I'm rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic when I'm taking care of something that's preventable. The feeling that you walk away with is helplessness, maybe as helpless as the guy sitting on uh, the mattress. Circus performer Ralph Prado is fighting for his life, even though he has received massive amounts of anti-venom for a rattlesnake bite. Dr. Bush has done all he can. It was very touch and go. Sometimes we'd get it under control, and we'd say, oh, he's looking better. 
and then sometimes you look worse, and it's like, oh, we need to get back on top of this parameter here. And there was times when we, we had a lot of doubt whether the medicine would work, whether our resources were adequate, whether our knowledge was adequate. If you do this job long enough, uh, you, you have to be humble. Otherwise, this job will humble you. After many hours of no improvement, Ralph shows small signs that the anti-venom is beginning to work. I got a sense that this guy was a survivor. And I felt optimistic for him. And we were following his lab work. And one of the first things I remember his blood started to clot normally again. And we started getting ahead of the kidney damage that was being done. Started to breathe on his own. And gradually, he was showing signs of life, like he may pull through. Hey, Ralph. How you doing? Yeah, you hanging in there? Yeah, kind of hard to all over. Now, have a second chance in life. I am more careful what I, what I uh, play with, you know. Ralph was under the impression that he was immune to snake venom. Because I used to pick up my rattlesnakes off, off, right off the ground, like there was uh, you picking up a dog. And he thought that because he would drink the venom and he thought that it might confer some sort of immunity to him. Now I see a rattlesnake, it's like, I know what they're capable of. I know they can take, uh, take, take my life. He's a character. He's not like me, you know, I mean, he's not like you, but he's an interesting, unique guy, and I'm glad he's still here. It is wonderful feeling, you know, to have a second chance of life. You know, it's almost like a being reborn. Three and a half weeks later, Dr. Rob Steele is now the patient waiting to see if he was infected with HIV by the man whose life he saved. Hey, Dr. Steele. Yes. Good news, you're negative. Everything's clean. Yeah. I came full circle. I came to the point where emergency medicine was something that almost killed me. But I also came to the point where I realized emergency medicine is the only field where you see patients, regardless of ability to pay, regardless of the time of day, regardless of their complaint, you see all comers. You help a lot of people, and you change people's lives, and you save people's lives. And it is a calling that not every doctor can do. It's not always glorious. It's sometimes really dirty. It's sometimes hard medicine, but it's great medicine.